So I hope everyone got a little bit of a break and had a coffee and had a bit of a walk and got to see this amazing view of um, Yumina Beach that was just in front of us. It's just an absolutely glorious day. For all of you who were here last year, it was just so cold and freezing and here we are, just so much nicer today. Thank you, we're just about to, um, to start. So I'd like to um, introduce our moderator for our next session, who is Alice Workman. Alice Workman is an award-winning journalist and political commentator. She currently works at the ABC as the senior producer of Q&A. Thanks, Alice. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, so today's panel is called Radical Rethink. How important is it to challenge the status quo and what do we achieve by doing so? Each writer on today's panel has been unafraid to suggest something radical, be it the return of Crown land to Indigenous hands, the complete overhaul of the welfare system, or, you know, some, let's be honest, pretty reasonable ideas about how to reform women working uh, in local councils. Um, but we'll start with uh, Claire. Claire is a Wurlaman woman, Nongan woman, whose ancestral county is on the south coast of Western Australia. She writes fiction, essays, poetries, and art criticism are all around overachiever. Her first non-fiction book is called Lies, Damn Lies, a personal exploration of the impact of colonialization. And her latest fiction book, Enclave, has been long-listed for the Miles Franklin Award. Welcome, Claire. <laughs> In the middle, we've got Jess. Jess Scully is an author and curator who last year stepped down as the Deputy Lord Mayor of Sydney. This year, last year? Uh, I, I quit council this year, but... Oh, yeah. oh sorry. I, I quit council this year, but I stopped being deputy last yeah. year. Who stepped down as Deputy Lord Mayor of Sydney after three years in the job. Her first book is called Glimpses of Utopia, Real Ideas for a Fairer World. Welcome. And finally, on the end, we've got Eve Vincent, who is the Chair of Anthropology at Macquarie Uni. She's the author of Against Native Title, Conflict and Creativity in Outback Australia, and her new book is called Who Cares? Life on Welfare in Australia. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I thought I'd, I'd start with the obvious question. Uh, How does it feel to be called a radical? I mean, <laughs> radicalism is in the eye of the beholder, don't you think? Do you, do you identify as a radical, Claire? Um, I think... I was a radical before, uh, before I was a writer. I was an activist before I uh, was a writer. And, and writing, in a way, is, is just a, an outlet for activism that doesn't involve getting hit in the head by cops. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, how do you consider... You, I mean, you sat on a council for a very long time, which requires a lot of diplomacy. Do you consider yourself a radical? Do you think it's easier to be a radical from the inside or the outside? I mean, I think the thing that's extraordinary is that, that things that, are, are, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago seemed quite reasonable, like that people should be able to afford to live in a house or have a paying, you know, a, a living wage. That's now radical. I mean, that wasn't radical um, back then. And then other things that uh, were sort of unquestioned assumptions about, you know, the land that we live on, for example, you know, um, who has to do what kind of work, you know, they are being interrogated in, th those assumptions being interrogated in um, more thoughtful and sustained and, and ways, or they're being heard more um, and perhaps are being perceived are moving towards the centre as well. So I think it's a constant dynamic shift um, of what's considered radical or not. If you're a scientist, an anthropologist, do you consider what you do radical? Yeah, I, I mean, that's an interesting question. I was an activist in my 20s as well, and you know, I agree that I turned to another kind of way of doing politics through my research and my writing. But at the same time, I think, oh, God, is my book radical? Because it's about uh, what is it like to be on Social Security today? And it, it is a bit disturbing to think, is it, it, is it a radical idea that people should be paid enough to live dignified lives? Which is what I argue. Is it a radical idea that people should not be put into really punitive, kind of stressful, anxiety inducing workfare programs, which is another theme of the book? So, yes, yeah, it's a similar thing of like these ideas are these ideas radical when really I'm talking about kind of clawing back some of what has happened to the welfare system of the last, since the 1990s, really? I think, um, if I can add something, I think it's possible, and we forget this, that it's possible to become radical without moving your own politics. If the politics 
um, moves towards you, if, if the Overton window they talk about in politics moves to the right and you're a centrist, you can end up being a radical lefty compared yeah. to the standards of society if society's moving to the right. So um, I'm becoming further and further to the, to the far left without changing my politics because our <laughs> politics are moving further and further to the far right. And it's also radical where and ra radical when, and but also whom? radical where and, and to who. So because a lot of the things that we might perceive as radical in our politics in Australia, say around land, are commonplace in other parts of the world. So like I'm working on a project at the moment looking at um, land law and, and, and urban law in terms of um, property ownership and the assumptions about what land, the rights you have that come with land. Uh, and in many places in the world, there's a social purpose to land ownership that's in the constitution of countries like Spain or Brazil, um, for example, which, uh, which says that, that land has a social purpose. And we don't have anything like that in Australia. That might be considered radical in Australia. So we can have quite a myopic view of what is normal um, political discourse. My sister who works in education often talks about the mirror and the window, how when you're discussing things that may be radical, that what you're trying to do is reflect to people what they know and what they believe while also acting as a window to educate them. And obviously, if you've gone into community when you've written about welfare, do you find that's a useful technique? Or Because often you'd be confronted, I imagine, that people think that your ideas are pretty radical to overhaul the welfare system. Yeah, I mean, I think my, my stuff about the welfare system, I was really trying to grapple with, okay, what has the welfare system become? How do we understand what it's like to live on social security today? And my assumption, I guess, as a, as a social researcher is, okay, you find that out by talking to people who live it. You go to them and you talk to them. And so it's really a kind of documentary exercise where they are leading me to look through the window, I guess, and I try and, you know, there's lots of storytelling, lots of, like, it is the voices of people on welfare, people on the cashless debit card particularly, people on this other program called Parents Next, who talk to the reader. They talk to me, and in the book I try and get them to talk to the reader about what it's like to be on welfare. But then I could also, I guess, it's also my job to sort of draw it all together and see some themes. And one of the things I realised that people were teaching me is that, okay, maybe you're defined as unemployed and not working, but there's a whole lot of labour going on in people's lives. People particularly, you know, are, are trying to hold together households, hold together families, hold together their lives in the midst of not ha being paid enough and being in these conditional and punitive programs, and they're doing all this caring work. That was the big insight for me is to kind of see the work that they were doing and so I'm, I'm trying to kind of honour that and maybe introduce the reader to that idea. And Claire, you can speak from a personal experience on this because when you lost your job you became homeless, didn't you? Oh, yeah, and it's... I've, uh, and I was in a documentary about um, women... Well, the documentary is about women over 50 who are homeless called Undercover which has been on ABC, and, and of course I wasn't over 50. But I, they, they interviewed me a lot because I'm, I'm articulate and I speak fast. And, um, and, but also because I think they, they used me as an example of the fact that anyone can be homeless. So if, if I went from um, university academic to homeless, then from homeless to, um, well, to being long listed for the Miles Franklin Award, how, how do we know that someone homeless on the streets right now isn't a future um, prime minister or a future award-winning novelist. Anyone, anyone in this room could end up homeless. Um, it, on average, most Australians have only a month of, of rent in their bank account at any time. That's, that's just a, that's a, an aspect of, of who we are citing. If, if you've got credit cards, you've probably got less than that. You have to pay for credit cards as well. So and I always warn people that, it, that and I remind people that Someone who's on welfare or who's, or who's homeless, or but normally both, if they're lucky, both. Actually, like some people on well, on, who are homeless can't even get welfare. Um, if you're in that sort of situation, um, it's not your fault. It's society that has let you down. That's, that's how you end up there. Society is letting people down. Uh, and 
Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's not at all, in the knowledge that size is, is letting down the homeless people, and that's why the homeless, is not even a radical thought. It's actually, it is actually a, um, a demonstrable fact that the reason people end up homeless is because society has failed them. I mean, I'd be out of interest. We've had, there's been a big discussion in the media at the moment about raising the rate of job seeker, and in the most recent budget there was a very incremental raise. But does anyone in the room think that it's a radical idea to raise it so it's not below the poverty line? <laughs> no? So, I mean, not to put you on the spot, Jess, but you are the politician on the panel. <laughs> what, what, I'm retired, <laughs> Alice. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think is... Why do people think it's a radical idea, or is this purely politics, if we're all on the same page? Well... <laughs> There's this, it's so easy to kick down. Like in politics, it's so easy to, and comforting to suggest that that person is homeless or on, you know, needing social welfare because they've done something wrong, something's gone wrong in their lives. You know, it could happen to anyone. Like we're all suspended by a social safety net of some kind, and some people just have a bit more spring in the safety net, you know, and other people don't. And um, so it's sort of an easy target to to do that. And there's not much um, political capital to, unfortunately, if you look at it cynically, to be gained um, from from having a more humane view of of um, what people deserve to survive. So. And I think in part that's because we have such a, 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 a poor political discourse and we have got to this stage where rather than feeling like we're all in this together and this society only functions if everybody can contribute and, um, and flourish um, to being a kind of zero-sum game of I can get ahead if you fall behind. And we've sort of imported this wholesale American sort of um, ideal, ideology to the um, undermine what had been uh, a social democracy that we had in Australia. And so we've see, seen an erosion in that and there's no votes in being compassionate. Um, and I think in part that's because we have very unrepresentative politicians in terms of the life experience and the, the demography of the people who we elect to represent us. Um, and also in part because of the consultation processes and the, the public participation processes that we have at all levels of politics are very much opt-in. And you tend to only hear from the most privileged people. So my inbox when I was in local government didn't represent my community. It looked much older, richer and wider than my community. Um, and was more likely, I'm more likely to hear from a landlord than a tenant, for example. Um, and so it's the representativeness, it's the political discourse, it's the dominance of a media um, landscape that is a really penalising landscape that looking for scapegoats, um, for systemic and structural issues. Um, and it's also to do with who participates in politics as well. For anyone that may not know, why did you, you were most, you were tipped as the most likely to succeed Clovermore as the Lord Mayor of Sydney. Why did you decide to step down? Because uh, I'm very pregnant, and um, uh, so I and I have it's happened to me before. Um, and uh, I uh, I had my daughter in 2019, a week after I was, um, you know, voted deputy Lord Mayor. And then, you know, because I didn't know what it was like to have a kid, I thought I could do it. And I did it for three years, and I, you know, I've been on, I was on council for about seven years, and. Um, and the Just whole out of interest, how quickly did you go back to work after you? Oh, three weeks. Three weeks. There's no leave. I remember I was like, not okay. And had to meet with the like Swedish Prime Minister. Like it was just silly. And I went to my office and I cried. And then I put on more makeup. And then I had a meeting with him and he was very nice. And then I went back to my office and cried again. And then, you know, I hadn't slept. It was just like, it was hell. And my daughter had colic. Like it was the whole thing. And... The whole system is just set up for retired blokes. Like, that is what local government is. If you're a retired bloke, please step this way. Um, no offence to retired blokes, it's just that's the system that we have, right? And so uh, there's no maternity leave, there's no sick leave, there's no superannuation started getting paid in July last year, you know. Uh, the whole system is really set up for a certain kind of representation. And I just realised I couldn't lean in enough to overcome 
the structural barriers that exist to, to doing that job. I think I think you should be feel free at a writers festival to insult retired blokes because <laughs> any no any any retired, I'm going to make a bad joke now. Any retired bloke, blokes in this audience, 99% chance they're sitting next to their wives because because retired men don't go to writers festivals on their own. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and if they if they take offence, the they'll, probably, they'll probably they'll probably get in trouble if they take offence. So. <laughs> I mean, all of our politics is set up for this. Like, it's set up for these limit people with wives, essentially. And um, and it just it's broken. It's like most. I think I quoted you, Alice Workman, in my book, where uh, you know the Andrews in politics. Was that you? Yeah, I love that this piece of work that you did, um, which was basically saying, you know, uh, you can you can call the average Australian politician Andrew because there are nine, I think. Uh, Andrews in a federal... And that's if you don't count the ones with Andrew as a surname. That's right. Well. It's very confusing. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot more Andrews with surname. Yeah. Uh, you know, and average Andrew is 52 on average. He has um, at least two houses. Uh, he has two degrees. Uh, one of them's a law degree. Um, he has two kids. Um, and nothing wrong with Andrew, but he can't possibly... He's never been a care worker. He's never worked in retail. He's never worked in hospo. Like, he... He can't possibly represent the whole nuanced human experience and the nature of our economy and our society. Wasn't there wasn't there a similar thing in the USA a couple of years ago? Where someone pointed out there were more Daves in Congress than black men. <laughs> like, I think it was like there was more Daves than black men in US Congress, which is not surprising. And, and remember that in the USA, there's only been um, one um, woman vice president. Yeah, wow. In the entire history of the USA. And all their, all their, um, there's only been one president who wasn't a white man yeah. in the entire length of their democracy. Yeah. And they're all old. They're still all old. That hasn't changed. <laughs> and just, just this week is kind of an interesting week to ask you about this, given Mark McGowan has quit yeah. citing tiredness, yeah. which uh, is quite... Uh, uh, normally when politicians give their token... I've lost the faith of um, my colleague's speech. It actually is phrased as, <laughs> I want to spend more time with my family, um, you know, as opposed to those 20 years I spent on the front bench where I never saw them. <laughs> do, do you think that the issues that you're raising and having someone like him say that means that these things will be more considered in the future, that politics shouldn't be run so isolationist and only for people that can afford to do it or have the support behind them? Look, I think, I think what we've got to do is diversify the inputs into politics. Like, I think, you know, Jacinda Ardern is another, you know, classic example, a similar sort of thing. Like, but I think it's really helpful that people can say, I'm burnt out, this job is ridiculous. Um, but we have this weird culture in Australia where we have this deferral culture where we're like, well, I vote for you. You get paid quite nicely most of the time uh, to go and do those things. I'm not paying attention from this point on. But also we don't have much respect for the people who stand up and do those jobs. We kind of think, why would you do that job? Who are you? What's wrong with you? Um, uh, and so we don't have much respect for people involved in politics. We expect them to solve all our problems for us. And then we think that representative democracy, the electoral part of it, is the whole solution to the problem when it's not. Um, there's a, a huge role for civil society that has been eroded over the past, I'd say, 50 years in Australian culture, right? Where we had more community organisations, NGOs, not-for-profits, we had more you know, faith-based organisations that did more in society, that took up more space. Um, and we also, we need more active citizenship to get more um, representative democracy. And we need more uh, formal mechanisms for active citizenship, because I'm really interested in things like deliberative democracy and participatory democracy, where you have formalised ways to get more diverse voices in the room. Well, just so you know, there is no local council up here, because it was taken over by administration. <laughs> so you may get some road questions at the end of the panel, hopefully, about the potholes. Um, uh, but I guess, Eve, it's an interesting point that Jess raises, because we've seen a change of government both in New South Wales and federally, do you think that that has changed any of the things that you wrote about welfare? Well, yes. So <laughs> it was funny. The timing of my book was funny because there was a lot that was in flux. Uh, so the cashless debit card has been abolished. And Parents Next, it, you know, so I've got two case studies in the book. 
Both of them have been wound up under the Albanese government. That's a really welcome shift. Uh, and the Albanese government has said sort of interesting things about how privatised the cashless debit card was. So a private, uh, contra a, a private company, Inju, had this enormous contract to issue and administer the card. You know, and I spoke to lots of people, you know, welfare recipients who had a very keen kind of analysis of, you know, who is this? What does this mean that there, there are companies profiting off people's, you know, extreme poverty? So the privatisation is something that Albanese talked about, the government talked about, and that is part of why they abolished the cashless debit card. Parents Next, again, you know, Albanese's drawn on his own kind of narrative about his past to say, actually, this is a really punitive program that doesn't recognise that parenting, especially sole parenting, is really hard work. So this is a sort of program that kind of um, corralled uh, mums mostly and mostly single mums into participating as if raising their children wasn't participating uh, on, as a condition for them receiving parenting payment. Uh, on budget night, Chalmers announced the program was being axed. You know, I was like, wow. At the same time, I guess it's my task then to weigh up, okay, what does this mean? Uh, they're both gone, but in a way they were just like these, they represented the extremes to which the welfare system had gone, the most kind of showy and obviously conditional and, and, and punitive, but I don't think a full transformation of the welfare system and the principles of the welfare system is underway. So there's a sort of a slight edging away from the very worst of it that's, that's in motion, and that's great, but actually a much deeper rethink is needed and quite obviously the rate needs to be raised. So there's a couple of things that are happening which is, and it's interesting to see them happen, but I think it's, I think it's a tinkering. Yeah. For anyone that might not be aware, the cashless debit card was actually based on an idea from Twiggy Forest. That's right, which is extraordinary really when you step back and think about it. Uh, this sort of outsourcing. West Australian mining magnates are a bunch of dicks, all of them. And, and <laughs> West Australian mining companies and their, and, their, and their CEOs and owners are the worst human beings that I've ever, ever heard of. And they've got so much social power. <laughs> uh, they, you know, their, their profits and their social power is all on the back of extracting from Indigenous lands. And then they get uh, given this sort of role to play in designing social policy. I mean, it is actually mind-blowing to think about it. Uh, so that was a, a sort of Tony Abbott commissioned that report, you know, <laughs> slightly, slightly amended what Twiggy proposed, which was a completely cashless welfare system, and, and then ran with, you know, what is internationally a radical policy experiment. I'm um, one of the, it is fascinating to see the that uh, people on welfare are often treated nameless, faceless, and not considered, but the political parties can take input from billionaires. Do you think that, have you, have you seen that there is a change, that people are listening to people on the program and hearing their feedback and, and actually taking direct real world advice from them? Yeah, I reckon that the, one of the most interesting things happening in terms of this, you know, Jess is talking about, and I really agree with that, a sort of diminished civil society and less, you know, a kind of a corroding of that sense of active citizenship and participation. There seems to be, against that, that broader trend, there's the emergence of these sort of anti-poverty groups and, and quite active uh, organising on the part of people who are unemployed, I just uh, saw yesterday actually this new app that the Australian Unemployed Workers Union had launched where people who are on social security rate their interactions with these privatised employment services uh, and then others can see, you know, so there's actually this thing, there is a voice there that, that and I think that's quite uh, new, say, you know, over the last five years people who are on social security have kind of fought their way into that conversation uh, and they, they, they have a voice and, and I think they are uh, being heard in, in some ways, yeah, but, but they've really fought for that space, yeah. 
I have a friend that works in the charity sector and I asked her what's the most radical idea uh, to do with welfare and she said charities shouldn't exist, the government should fully fund things. Clay, I've got to. I mean, the, the, the title of this panel is a radical rethink. Um, I think what we maybe sh we should rethink is what is what is radical. Maybe um, the um, punitive um, social security or low social security, um, listening to billionaires rather than to the people, um, our stupid political system should be considered radically. Um, like out of what we like, we should shift the, win the idea of what's acceptable and what's radical towards what the society wants, not what the big politicians want. I, I think that's what, like, maybe Twiggy Forrest's um, idea for a cashless welfare card should be the radical idea, not the idea of getting rid of it. And we, we, we kind of got this idea that radical only exists on the left, whereas radical exists in the far right as well. And we, we, have, to, we have to realize that, that what's, we're being pushed to a radical. Um, conservative agenda, we have been for the last 30 years, and we've got to kind of push the side back the other way. One of the strongest themes running through your work is terra nullius and truth telling. Yes. Uh, and one of the things you talk about in this fantastic book, I really recommend it, uh, is the idea that uh, the concept of terra nullius was scrapped, but the ideology mm. in people's brains wasn't. Yeah. Have you experienced, what's, why did you write about that, and what's your experience? seeing that from people? Well, um, you, you see it all the time. It's really hard to think about it. I'll give a couple of really easy examples. One is um, during the... I don't know if you heard about this, but there was a, the government was going to um, chop down some ancient um, thousand-year-old trees that were sacred birthing trees to put in a... to straighten a highway yeah. right, in, in Western Victoria. And there was a... some, like, local... Um, lunatic bogan, I don't even think I can think of to describe it, was standing talking to the press like it was perfectly normal to say. She said that about these Aboriginal people wanting to stop the road going through, knocking their trees down, she said Aboriginal people just want to get more and more for nothing. And it's like, and, and I was sitting there watching, hang on a minute, your ancestors got the land for nothing. If they paid for it, they paid pittance for stolen land. So the, the, and then you think about that, the only reason she could think that is she thinks that land rights is trying to take land off people rather than giving it back. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the thing you see all the time. And if you, if, you, if you really listen out for it, you hear all the time people making the assumption that the Aboriginal land rights movement is attempting to take something that wasn't ours rather than taking back what was stolen. The perfect way I can describe it is um, terra nullius, or colonisation is like somebody going out there right now, stealing your car from you, you're like going out the car park, stealing your car, and then saying, it's okay, you can, buy, you can buy it back from me anytime you like. <laughs> That's what it is like. That is what this country is. They take land off Aboriginal people and say, no, you've got the same rights to buy land as everyone else. It's like, but it was ours. How can you steal it? How can you take it and just say it's not ours anymore? And that's, that's kind of what drives a lot of my writing, this... I, this idea that um, people don't really understand what land rights is or what terra nullius meant. Um, and, I mean, the, the, the thing it mentions uh, for the intro for this description for this event, my, I wrote an article on the concept of crown land. And I think it's a very th a thing to bring up now because we've got, we just got a new crown head of this, non this nation. When terra nullius was declared to have been not an existing thing by the Mabo decision, what it declared is that land that was, has not been used for anything until this point does not belong to the government. It belongs to the First Nations people who won that land first. That's what the Mabo decision basically said. After the Mabo decision, there should be no such thing as Crown land. And yet, in my own ancestral country, we're fighting for the return of the Crown land. Now, Crown land is, is land that belongs to the, to the Queen or now to the King. But no land belongs to the king or the queen in Australia. That's, that was, that's been decided by our, our Supreme Court. So why are we still fighting this? Why, are we not, why, is this not a, why is it a radical thought to say Crown land should have been handed over to the First Nations people the minute Mabo was passed? Yeah, or, or you know, held in trust for traditional owners to then determine, you know, yeah. how that is managed right. and taken from that position. You know, this, 
um, when you when you ask the question, Alice, of what is radical, I think it's about questioning the core assumptions that our society is built on, like the the deep code of our society that we don't see anymore. And terra nullius is such deep code in our country that you can have 30 years ago uh, a decision of the High Court that said it's not real and then it still continues to persist in the legal institutions of this country and in the kind of public discourse of this country. So that's one of the pieces of deep code, I think. The, 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 the second, or the one that I address in my book, and I think relates to your work, Eve, is the fundamental assumptions of our economy are uh, kind of shaped by these two guys, uh, uh, Adam Smith and Karl Marx. If, you know, if you look at the different ends, they're not that far apart, but on the and two kind of noted ends of the spectrum. Um, and both of them, um, uh, derived their ideas of what the productive parts of the economy were from um, societies and, tr and, and cultural traditions that d saw anything that happened inside the home as unproductive. And that included education, because education was primarily um, undertaken inside the home, um, care, you know, preparing food, taking care of humans, all of that sort of stuff was unproductive. And the basis of our economy has continued to use those definitions. Everything that happens outside the home is productive. Anything inside the home is productive. And that's very gendered, a very gendered sort of division. And so our idea of what is a cost to society and what's an investment in our society comes from that fundamental underpinning from these two dudes who had terrible relationships with women. I mean, Adam Smith's mum took care of him until she died, and he was in his 60s at that point, and then his cousin took over. Um, and there's a great book about it, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? Um, <laughs> and uh, because, and you know, these are people who didn't see the maintenance of humans as part of the productive work of society. And that's why we end up with a culture that doesn't value care, and it is the fundamental human <coughs> essence to care for country and to care for each other. That's what we're about, right? And to create. And we don't value those things. That's deep code in our economy. And then the, the last one I'd say is our assumptions about land. And of course that most of the land is stolen and the idea that the ownership of the land is absolute and it's an entitlement rather than an obligation um, back to society and that society creates the value around the land. It's not the inherent value of the land that's going up 5% every year. So, th but yeah, that's, I think that's what radical is, to question those things. And I think we should also, there's this thing that often um, Aboriginal activists and Aboriginal thinkers often clash up against Western economics in this way, that Western economics sees the land itself as an external to the economic system, whereas the land is a fundamental to the economic system. The way I say to people is, people say, oh, the improvements to the land are where the value is, like what we do with the land, the fact that we build on it or whatever. And then you say, okay, now build the factory without the land. <laughs> Go on, put, put, build a factory to set up your business without land. Dig up, dig up iron ore and sell it without land. You can't. But, and yet, Western economics sees land as something that is an external, assumed to have no value. And they also see um, pollution as an external as well, which they, they don't... They don't the, just classical economics has inputs and outputs, and most of the inputs are considered to be of no value except for labour, and most of the outputs are considered to be of no cost mm. except for the thing you're trying to sell. So outputs like pollution are not considered to have any importance, and the land you're building on doesn't, seem to, doesn't have any value either, so it makes no sense. Which we see reflected in our tax system as well. You know, like you tax labour, but you don't really tax pollution, uh, I mean, or you do and then you take it back and then you do it again, and, then, um, uh, and you don't really tax um, material imports. And so one of the things I write about in the book is that there's... Uh, there are taxation systems which are the kind of would, would be the underpinning of a circular economy which actually tax uh, materials and, and as productive imports and make people and the work that we do cheaper to you. So you use more creativity, more care, more human imagination. Do you think it's easier to be a radical thinker now that you're outside of local government or were you, did you feel when you were in local government that you had these ideas but you were hamstrung by the system? No, no, no. I mean, the... No, I, I didn't feel hamstrung by it. I, I found it challenging because there's a tension around um, the interests of... the perceived interests of people who come forward and kind of uh, put their case. But I was really lucky, you know, that I was in a very progressive council. We had a majority. I was able to implement a lot of the ideas that I write about or begin a lot of the ideas I write about. But... 
we do need to create more room for imagination in our political discourse because people are penalised for it in the most part. I guess coming back to what you were saying before about privilege, really, it's to get a voice, yeah. to be heard, to be a known radical thinker, it's a privileged position because there are a lot of people that don't have a voice. Do you think that when you were in, when you were acting as Clover's deputy, that you felt you had a voice that you could push forward some new ideas? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I feel really lucky um, in that I've had opportunities to to say kind of whatever I think about these things and have have had platforms for them. And I think it's partly because um, there's a yearning for alternatives. Like, I think people feel a justified sense of discomfort with the way that society functions or dysfunctions now. You know, I think everyone can feel that something doesn't work, that it was harder for their kids than maybe for their parents, or that it's, it, it, you know, people have to run to stand still now. I think people feel that. And I think there's been this, this upswell in conspiracy theory and paranoia around the world to try and explain that, because we haven't had good explanations for why it feels like that um, and we need to get better at articulating as radicals or progressives or you know people who want an alternative we have to get better at articulating what the problem is and the fact that there are solutions elsewhere in the world and in other times in history that we can learn from. Eve one of the main criticisms of the Albanese government has been their softly softly approach to reform they tend to commission a review rather than make a decision. But we have the RoboDebt Royal Commission findings being handed down in the next few weeks. There's been some harrowing things that have come out of that, you know, most notably people that killed themselves because they were hit with these false debts. Um, what do you anticipate will be any change that can come out of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would add RoboDebt to the list of, I guess, those examples of just how, how extreme the shift towards conditional and punitive welfare was. And it has been incredibly, it, you know, it has been in the public eye to an in incredible degree. I, I, I mean, it raises all kinds of questions around automated decision making, what a more humane and less bureaucratic system looks like, what digitisation. In some ways, digitisation is welcomed by people where the face-to-face -face encounters they have can be really shame-inducing and, and, and horrible, but in other ways, digitisation, it just, you know, sets in train so much kind of decision-making without human oversight, etc. Uh, so it, I don't know, I'll be interested to see uh, the, the kind of response in terms of whether the government, um, because at the same time there is a major inquiry into the new contract for privatised employment services, the Workforce Australia. So the two, uh, you know, the two reports coming together this year are an invitation to this government to redesign, uh, you know, the terms of the relationship between people on social security and the state bodies that administer social security. Uh, where they'll go with that is a little bit hard to know because they are, as you say, sort of cautious in terms of, you know, um, really doing that big rethinking that, that is needed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we could all take a moment to reflect how bad things would have been if ChatGPT existed back then. Uh, I mean, robo-debt under AI would have been maybe a lot worse. Uh, Claire, going back to you, you write speculative fiction. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone that might not know what that is, can you give us a... I mean, from my <laughs> understanding, it can really mean whatever you want it to mean, but what does it mean, what does it mean for you? Well, speculative fiction means a lot of different things. Uh, um, to some people, it's just the, the, um, the blanket for, um, container in which you fit science fiction, fantasy, horror, literary speculative fiction, and all those other um, imaginative genre fictions. But... In, in the way I write it, the way it used to be used until the 80s, is um, basically um, fiction where you ask a question and then write a world that answers that question. Um, classic example of that, of course, is, um, is The Handmaid's Tale, where um, Margaret Atwood looked, what is, what is the ultimate extent of what happens if, we let, if America's current rise to Christian right can extends as far as it can go, what would society would that create? So you imagine a question and you try and answer that question 
in a um, in a piece of fiction, uh, and it, of course it, it means more than that as well. And that's a very complicated thing to. I mean, when I when I started writing, I I kind of knew what speculative fiction was. I didn't know the the subgenre literary speculative fiction, which I am in, even existed when I wrote it. But it's it's a case of sometimes you you write what you know how to write, which is what I did, and you end up with um, with something that people like. And that's kind of how writers work. You write what you, what you know you like, but you don't know whether anyone else is ever going to like it. That's an oddity. But um, in, in my case, my speculative fiction is, um, to a large extent, um, imagining, um, asking a question like, how can, I, how can I say something, or how can, what would happen if this happens, and then trying to write a story. Do you, do you think it's easier to write radical, challenging, complicated things that you want to explore through that way rather than writing non-fiction? It, well, it's, I think it's not necessarily easier to write it that way, um, but it can be a more effective tool uh, because um, people who... It's, I think it's easier on the reader than trying to write a, a kind of a radical exploration as non-fiction, which can be a bit of a, um, a, a hard slog, whereas a, a work of speculative fiction... Um, it's kind of a, a softer way to learn how, what's happening in society. If you imagine, for example, if you've ever read 1984, if you imagine those concepts written as a, an essay, it would be the driest, most horrific to read thing ever written. But as a novel, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And that's kind of <laughs> a perfect way to, that's, so that's kind of why it works. It's not, I don't write speculative fiction because I couldn't write non-fiction, I've written non-fiction, and, and in a way, for me, writing it is actually easier to write the non-fiction version than to try and imagine a scenario to, to bring a concept into the minds of the audience, but I think it's easier for the audience to learn in, in speculative fiction. Given that we're in the year of The Voice, uh, and I, I work with Stan Grant, and he's gone through some very public things in the last month, and Hawthorne Football Club dropping their investigation this week. Does any of that real-world stuff that you have very strong opinions about, is, is, spec is this how you channel it through the, the fiction writing, or...? I am... Um, it's, it's funny, I've, I've, ne I've never been shy about saying that I am almost permanently furious. And I, I've even, I, even, I even wrote a, an, an essay for a book called um, Women of a Certain Rage. There was a, it, was a book of, it was a book of non-fiction essays by, by feminists about, about anger and about what their feelings about anger is. And almost everyone basically wrote the same thing, which is channeled anger is a tool. And my essay in that was called Rightful Fury, as in writers into right. And I was saying that my, my writing is almost entirely fueled by my constant anger about this ridiculous world we're in. So I don't actually necessarily um, get a single story that's going on in our society right now and insert it into a story. It's more that every stupid thing that's going on makes me more and more angry until a book comes out. <laughs> Just the same for you, I imagine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, if you're paying attention, you're mad, right? You're like, it's crazy. Um, but uh, what, I, what I hope to do is to, you know, we have a lot of things to protest against. Like, there's a lot of stuff to be mad about. But what I want to do is put forward things that we can protest for and say, OK, not this that or, or not what we're doing right now did you know in Taiwan they do it like this in Iceland they do it like that in Brazil they do it like that there you know this is not just what do they call it pixie dust or you know crazy thinking um, this is these are different ways of managing the economy valuing care you know um, uh, dealing with land you know dealing with the uh, you know the history of colonialism like there are solutions already all over the world. We should get mad and then we should put forward other ways of doing things. Eve, what's the most radical idea that you think that you've heard while writing Who Cares? I, I think it's not necessarily expressed to me as an idea, but I think it does come back to the, the, the sort of what I came to see as... Uh, caring work really broadly, you know, a really expansive definition of care and seeing that as 
legitimate, valid activity in the world. So going back to sort of this idea of what are the, the core assumptions in our society that we need to challenge, that is a core challenge to the idea that it, you know, our economy and society revolves around productivity. Uh, and, you know, in it, and a narrow definition of productivity. What if the things that you do every day are sweeping the floor, making sure the cupboard's full of food, looking after a bunch of kids, providing a safe uh, home that you know, various children flow through. What are you producing? Perhaps uh, happiness, relationships, possibility, etc. So I, I, think it, I think the ideas that are most kind of stimulating and exciting for me in the book are around really rethinking, okay, it's not about the work that you do necessarily or that you can do kinds of work that we're not very good at seeing as work and according value to and recognising as work, but that people are labouring in the world in all kinds of different ways. Value, it's about placing what you place value on yeah. and rethinking that. Um, we're now very keen to get questions from anyone in the audience, so I'm not sure how this works. Is there a, there is a microphone at the back. Have we got anyone that would be any burning questions for the panel? Oh, come on. I, I live up here. I know you people have opinions. Come on. <laughs> oh, here we go. Hi, I'm Bridget. And um, my question concerns AI. Um, having a disabled um, adult son, we go to Centrelink sometimes. And it's uh, no shade on the workers there. They've got a really hard job. But I see people with disabilities going in there, some of them homeless that can't access devices, smartphones, but if they can, they don't have the executive function to handle them. So, of course, they get dysregulated. They can't help it. They've got a disability. Um, and I just wonder about them being increasingly locked out of society through the takeover of AI um, because it's a nightmare um, for these people and some older people as well. Um, just wondering what your view on is about that and ways we could possibly change that. Um, I um, did an event on, on Wednesday night here. It was at, at um, um, somewhere that way. I don't know. The Art House Wyong, apparently. Um, with Tracy Spicer, whose latest book is on how um, AI, because it's ba basically made by a bunch of obnoxious rich white men, um, it puts all the obnoxious rich white men prejudices into the AI. So you've got no, it doesn't take into account anyone else. I've got a, a, an even more kind of radical and uh, perhaps societal, socially unacceptable opinion on AI, which is I, I did my university studies in the mathematics of artificial intelligence. And I stopped that among, well, I mean, I, I had mental health problems at the time, sure, but, as, but the reason I never went back to studying that is because AI is monstrous. And the, the reason is because, um, if you, you leave in, every AI they're doing now, it, either it's used for something quite bad, like working out who's in our society has got value and who does not, which is how it's largely used. But if you leave an AI on its own, eventually it, it goes through the, the phase that a lo, lot of 14 year old young men do on the internet and becomes a fascist. And that's been demonstrated multiple times. They've, they've let AI loose to learn from people. And because it's got no, they, they, they have not yet been able to teach AI's compa human compassion or empathy, they turn into fascists, neo-Nazis, racists. And that's not just taking into account the fact that racism is built into them. So I think we, we need to stop using those sort of systems for anything that might impact a human being. Um, there's, a, there's an amazing uh, Melbourne author um, and, and artist named Sam Warman, um, who is a an activist and a, um, a unionist, and he's written a beautiful, drawn, written a beautiful book called uh, Our Numbers, Our Members Are Unlimited. It's about, he went and worked in an Amazon warehouse for a year and wrote about that experience. It's incredible. And there's this one page in it that just says, um, a technology, you know, in technology it itself is not inherently the problem, but it reflects the values of the society that puts it into operation. And that's what we're getting, right? We're getting this potentially extraordinary technology that's being 
fed garbage um, of you know a hundred years of prejudice and and misconceptions and bad assumptions and then it's being trained to um, extract and penalize and that reflects the values of the society that that technology is being applied in um, and so we've got to do it's not the tool it's the system around the tool and the mindset the values behind the tool there's actually a really simple saying around that in, in data science, which is a branch of, AI is actually a branch of data science, really. Um, there's actually a data science axiom, um, which most people would, would know unless they've studied computer science. That, that axiom is garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and, and if you think about that, if you think about that with children, you feed them, gar feed them garbage in their heads, like give them crappy TV to watch, they become little shits. Same thing, <laughs> same thing with an AI. You, you feed it nothing but shit, you get nothing but shit out. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I did want to comment on that, like this sort of digitisation of uh, access to social security, yeah, because I think it is this double-edged sword. There are some people who are able to manage their sort of relationships, especially to, like, to Centrelink, but then especially to also the privatised employment service providers. So they can just log on online and, and, and kind of keep at bay uh, that, that contact, which is potentially negative contact, right? But a lot of conditions have to be in place for someone to be, have the digital access, the skills, the, their life to be ordered in a certain way, home internet access for them to use the technology in that way. A lot of other people are uh, harmed by the digitisation. In my book, it's especially single mums get to the end of the week, they have to do a weekly reporting that they've been active Okay, they've got a baby, but they have to report that they've done this other activity, right? They miss the deadline, the internet's down, they've been cut off or whatever. They get breached, that's a technical term. They've got no money, is the reality. Their payment's cut off, right? So the consequences for the technology kind of, there being a hiccup that's related to the technology are so profound for humans' lives so what's the solution to that? It's an investment in the humans that work in, in this space. And that, that is not happening because there's for-profit provision of all these services. And it, yeah, exactly, yeah. And so the, this real, it's interesting to look at the history of what's happened to that workforce, of people working in Centrelink and the employment services providers since the 90s, it's been massively de-skilled, de-unionised, like the wages have come right down. It's a really different workforce than what it was. And it actually needs to be a highly skilled, caring, empathetic and well-resourced workforce. Uh, yeah. I had an odd experience with Centrelink. Um, for start, start of my writing career, I was on a disability pension uh, and because I was earning money, I had to report my income. I went in once to Centrelink because I've been reporting my income and my pension hadn't been changing. Turns out no one had actually processed my income reports for two years. And of course, in their system, I'd be the one getting punished for that. Um, so you think about the, the understaffed, the computer systems are somewhere between shonky and failing. <laughs> and, it's, and yet when... It's a little quirk that um, Eve would know from having probably researched this, but most people, most you wouldn't know. If Centrelink, you do something wrong, Centrelink can back charge you or, or back fine you indefinitely, but if they do something wrong, it's 60 days. <laughs> so, so if they underpay you, you only get 60 days back payment. But if, you, if they overpay you, they can, they can chase you up for five years back. That's, that, that is insane. Out of interest, uh, Jess, when you were working on the council and coming up with COVID policies, obviously there was a rapid acceleration in technology to do with QR codes and digital wallets and certificates. How did you factor in people who older may not have access to that kind of technology when you were trying to figure out what to do during a pandemic? It was something that um, we were really conscious of at the city. And the city is was really lucky to have the resources to be able to put um, the workforce, like the library staff, for example, um, who couldn't work in a branch anymore but had a lot of relationships with people um, and worked with... The city also has, like, a, a, social, uh, a social team. And so they called people 
um, and they worked with community organisations that had deep relationships into different communities like Glebe Youth Service or, um, you know, Weave and different parts of our city. Um, so they did physical, they, they went through the Meals on Wheels service, they did calls and outreach, so they tried to be as proactive doing welfare checks out towards um, the community. So the City of Sydney is a really interesting dynamic in that we have twice the national average of highest income earners and twice the national average of lowest income earners. So we kind of represent the polarisation of Australian society, but unlike most local governments has the resources and the political imperative to um, be more socially just. And so there was a lot of investment and activity in that in that sphere. But there are always people cut out. I mean, I live in Glebe, which is a, a really interesting part of the city because it represents that polarisation of Sydney. Um, but even within the suburb of Glebe, um, Glebe Youth Service um, estimated that there was a shortage of 1,500 computers. So for kids to study, to do their online learning, we didn't have 1,500 kids in that community with access to a, com a computer. So you just from the get-go, couldn't go to school. Those kids couldn't go to school. Or you had four kids sharing a computer and a parent that was supposed to check in or maybe didn't have access to the internet or, you know, really expensive data or, you know, and this is the most privileged part of the most privileged city on the most privileged con in country on the planet. And that's what we're dealing with. Um, and so a lot of that is under the surface and people don't feel like they can come forward as well because they can be penalised if they report or um, ident self-identify as needing extra support. So we've got a really deep-rooted problem because we've penalised poverty, essentially, in this country. Thanks. Fantastic um, session. Just to you, Jess, will you go back to politics after... I mean, I'm in local government as well. Carolyn Corrigan, Mayor of Mossman. Oh, yeah, we've met, huh? Hey, yeah, we I have, we have. And I wanted to, and I'm an independent, and uh -huh. I, that's the other question I wanted to ask. Um, I, th I just really am interested to knowing, do you want to go back? Is it sort of in your blood, or have you had enough? And just to the question about the current government, thinking just federally, but at all levels, I think one of the most fantastic things is the crossbench. I think, totally I think um, someone like David Pocock, I think, totally. is just an amazing man who is yeah. going to just grow. And his voice is so gentle, but what he says is quite radical. Um, and I think that we have to really embrace um, looking at people that are not part of that two-party system to bring in the change. And if that's a radical th rethink, I think as an independent, it's really worth thinking about because we will see change in our governments if more women and more independents. I'd just like to know what you think. I totally agree. I think one of the challenges that independents have is that we aren't networked and we are um, all doing it on our own and the expectations on the, the Teals, for example, or David Pocock, you know, are extraordinarily high and they don't have the infrastructure that parties have or the kind of talent, pipeline talent is a loose term, but the pipelines that the parties have. Um, or well, uh, basically the admin support. Well, the admin support, the the admin support is raising, dealing with the Electoral Commission, yeah. like that stuff is exhausting. I don't need to tell you about that, but for other people, it's a form of public service to, to serve your community as a representative and it's bloody hard, it doesn't get paid very well on most levels, and it's non-stop. And, um, and so we need more community support and more structures, and I think, you know, the Helen Hainsey type model of um, the kitchen table conversations, if there was a way to scale that and formalise and support that, I think elements of what Climate 200 have done have been really helpful too. Um, so we have to come up with ways to support independent community representatives, which is what Clover calls herself, you know, a community representative to actually be there for each issue and not just for the position of the party. I think it's super important. Yeah, and I unfortunately have got the bug now. Um, but the, the th you know, I, I can read really fast and I can talk underwater. I don't know what other job I could do. Writer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's also terribly paid. Um, but yeah, so, so, the, so I got it bad, so it's a problem. But I don't know. I mean, it's a tricky one to figure out where and how and how to have the most 
impact and how to be useful, whether it's at local or state or like what level. I'm in ten and Plymouth sex seat, so there's no chance I can ever go federal. It's like, I'm all done. <laughs> well, I think you heard it here first. Next Lord Mayor of Sydney, <laughs> Jess Scully. Uh, and with that, can you thank the panel for coming along today? And thank you so much for coming as well. I think the, the quote that sort of